welcome friends uh, welcome to the eq series in which we try to discuss the clinical questions that we find in the exam and a very typical patient that you might also find in your ward now this is a question from neurology let's try to discuss it a 37 year old woman complains of dropping of her eyelid double vision and fatigue at the end of the day now there are three symptoms that she come to me with weakness to keep the eyelid open and maybe some weakness in the extraocular muscle also causing a double vision or diplopia and very typical that the more she works the problem happens to be more at the end of the day further history reveals that she has got difficulty in chewing food some weakness in climbing the stairs as well now difficulty in chewing food means a problem in the facial muscle and weakness in climbing the stairs means there's a proximal muscle weakness also on examination, there is a weakness of the eyelid, masticatory muscle, and of course the thigh flexors. Her hand grip decreases on the repetitive action. So when we tell her to hold something and on repetitive action, her hand grip decreases. Now she has got a few typical symptoms. One is an ocular symptom, that is a ptosis. Another ocular symptom may be an extraocular muscle weakness causing diplopia. And of course the proximal muscle weakness involving the lower limb as well as the face. And the very typical thing, at the end of the day, all these things happen to increase and she happens to improve on taking rest, right? There is no sensory abnormalities and the reflexes happen to be normal. Now let's try to look into the patient, what can be the kind of problem that she's suffering with? As we see in the typical question that we find that the muscles are weak in the patient. Is the patient having a disorder like uh, myopathy? If it have been a myopathy, why would she improve on rest and why should we aggravate it on weakness? She should have the weakness same throughout the procedure or the whole day. Can be a neuropathy disorder? Maybe. But in a neuropathy disorder, there has to be some sensory abnormality also that is typically lacking in the patient. Is it involving the spinal cord, myelopathy? Again, in myelopathy, there is a sensory involvement and of course, there is a bladder involvement seen in the patient. Or is it a kind of a cortical disorder? If it was a cortical disorder, then possibly the corticospinal tract of the body would be affected. And if the corticospinal tracts are affected in the patient, it is more of a distal muscle weakness. And of course, the reflexes have to be exaggerated. So we rule out a lot of things. It is unlikely to be a cortical disorder. Maybe <coughs> sorry, <coughs> myelopathy. It is not likely to be a neuropathy. It is unlikely to be a myopathy. So we are somewhere sitting at the neuromuscular junction. And all these things give us a sense that possibly she is having a neuromuscular junction problem at her age of 37. She can have a myasthenic gravis problem, which can present with an ocular symptom, facial symptom and the skeletal system. And now let's look at her chest x-ray. To explain the chest x-ray, I'd like Dr. Sumit to come and explain the chest x-ray and what are the clinical findings in that. Now, thank you, Dr. Achin, for an excellent description of the clinical case scenario. And we had a clinical case where we had a clinical history suggesting of myasthenia gravis and a chest x-ray was given. Now, suppose you are appearing for a, a clinical question in the exam. We already have some expectations in our mind. But I will first not talk about the expectation or the, you know, the possibilities that you have in your mind. I will first straight away take you to the x-ray and look at it in an unbiased manner. So let's look at the first, this is the chest x-ray frontal PA view for you. This is your cardiac cell hout. This is your lungs. I am sure you can localize the disease. Where is the disease? This is the disease. Can you see uh, in the area of the hilum on the right side, you can see a mass which has a well-defined smooth outer borders. It appears to have a broad base towards the mediastinum. So whenever we see something which is having a base towards the mediastinum, a smooth outer borders, it is a pointer towards mediastinal lesion. Not only that, now could this be hilar vessels? Now if you notice, through the mass you are able to see the hilar vessels. You can see the hilar vessels are actually converging or the lung vessels are actually converging onto the hilum that we can see through the mass. So if you are able to see these vessels through the mass, this is something which is called as hilum overlay sign. So once we see hilum overlay sign, it is telling you it is not, it, this is a mediastinal lesion which is either anterior or posterior to the hilum. And usually these end up being proved as anterior mediastinal masses. So we have now an x-ray suggesting a mediastinal lesion, probably anterior mediastinal, which is showing hilum overlay sign. And with the view of history that we had, 
we have a suspicion of a thymic neoplasm or a thymoma in our mind because we had a history of those ptosis and myasthenia gravis in the picture. And if we demonstrate this on a X-ray or on a CT, the management would change, which you will have, you know, Dr. Achin will talk about the management after, you know, this. But uh, this is very critical uh, thing that for which a patient would come to us for radiology. But often we are not able to diagnose it on an X-ray itself. We would actually need a CT scan to pick up and diagnose thymoma. On a CT scan, thymomas may show areas of cystic, uh, cystic degeneration or uh, calcification or we may see some evidence of invasion or even pleural deposits. So it's a very important uh, tumor which can spread by pleural de deposits as well. And there is something called as Masaka staging that is used to determine the surgical resectability of this tumor. Now with the background in mind that you know we have a background of uh, you know the disease in mind where we are instead of doing a CT scan we will try to confirm our finding on a simple lateral view. This is a lateral view. You can see this is your sternum. These are your vertebra. And this is that rounded opacity that you see in the retrosternal area. I am sure you can actually see with me. This is a rounded lesion that you see in the retrosternal area. This is the trachea shadow. So this is clearly an anterior mediastinum. You can see it is not overlapping the spine. It is in the retrosternal area. And normally behind the sternum, you should have a retrosternal air lucency, which we call as a retrosternal space or retrosternal lucency. And if you have an anterior mediastinal mass like this, it would obliterate it. Putting the clinical history as well as the, the X-ray findings together, we already know that we are dealing with a thymoma. So what else would I want to do here? What else would I want to do here is I would want to look at the pleural cavity as well. There is CP angles are clear. The lungs are otherwise clear. There is no other nodule in the lung. The cardiac size is normal. There is no other abnormality. We might want to do a CT scan to confirm our findings further. But in this x-ray and the clinical history, the findings and the diagnosis is fairly straightforward. We are looking at a thymoma. And it changes the surgical management because we know uh, how important this is. If you know this, you can actually go for an early resection of thymoma. We know the value of radiology here and the value of integration. Before I invite Dr. Achin again to discuss uh, this patient, I also want you to know in today's exam system, uh, there is a lot of value which is being given to integration. People who are able to integrate the clinical findings with the radiology and the lab findings are usually able to do better than others who are doing rote learning. Understanding is the key of the current exam system. I would like to invite Dr. Achin now. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, which of the following is the most likely diagnosis in the case? Let's see this. Is it a case of bronchogenic carcinoma, Hodgkin disease, or a thyroid tumor with a retrosternal extension or a thymoma? As sir discussed, it is most likely to be a case of thymoma and we can all connect it with the disease also. As I described in the case earlier, she was having a proximal muscle weakness with ocular weakness and the facial weakness as well. And all the things are more likely to be clinically a case of myasthenia gravis. And we know the main generator of antibodies for myasthenia is in the thymus and the patient in 10% of the myasthenic cases can harbor a tumor also inside that is known as the thymoma. So most important thing in this case as we can understand that apart from the normal treatment of myasthenia she can be a case for a thymectomy also and it's always most useful and mandatory that any patient with a thymoma and myasthenia comes to us we should always go for a thymectomy surgery. Reason being one thing that thymoma if keeps on growing in size can compress the neighboring structure that could be a local compressive effect or can be a simple paraneoplastic syndrome attached with it. So thymectomy is always being suggested in patients of myasthenia gravis in spite of the medical control provided they are somewhere in the bracket of 5, 15 to 55 years of age and more likely to be a case of generalized myasthenia gravis. As in this case, she is having the weakness all across the body and apart from the normal treatment of pyridostigmine or maybe an immunosuppressin, we will like to go for thymectomy in the case. So there can be more number of questions on this that how will we go and investigate the patient and what could be the better line of treatment. So normal treatment, pyridostigmine with a thymectomy would be ideal in this case. And as the clinical case is very clear, it's a case of thymoma. Thank you very much.